What's happening, everyone? Sorry, I have been a little bit quiet this week. I've been at a Poker Stars event in Las Vegas. It was sensational. But we are back at it now, and there is so much to get stuck into. What a week of football it's been. Actually, on that note, there is a massive poker event starting next week in Nottingham. I'm going to be there. Adam McCola's going to be there. And if you fancy playing, you could come along as well. Come and play some cards with us in Nottingham next week at the UK IPT. It will be mega and I hope to see you there. But now we have to fully focus on what is going on at Arsenal. Edu's leaving. They've only won 5 out of 10 Premier League games so far this season. The new signings haven't landed. They're conceding goals galore and their Premier League chances hang by a thread. So we need to explore it. We need to drill down into it. We need to give it the due diligence that it deserves. And the only way we can do that is by welcoming the king that is Harry Simeu onto the channel. Harry has a great Arsenal podcast. It's called The Chronicles of Agoon you simply must check it out. Right, coming live and direct from a hotel room in Milan, it is Harry Simu from the Chronicles of Aguna podcast. Obviously, you're still in Milan. You're still fighting your way back to London. Not a good result for you. A blip, Arteta's biggest blip since he's been in charge and a resurgent Chelsea waiting for you on the weekend. I think it's the first time for a long time that we're going into this fixture and I think that Chelsea are probably favourites. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Looking at Chelsea's current form, there's been a huge upturn under Enzo Maresca. I think there's a clear identity uh, with Chelsea these days. You know what you're going to get. You know, they've got options. It's a pretty deep squad. And for Arsenal, it's a tricky period. There's no question about that. You know, the, the loss at Bournemouth kind of started it. You thought there were signs of recovery with a really good first half performance against Liverpool. Then there was a Champions League game against Shakhtar at home that I don't really think you can read too much into. But the trip to Newcastle was as bad as Arsenal played in an awful long time. And they came to the San Siro last night, just down the road from me here, hoping to get that kind of statement victory that would put them back on track. And it wasn't to be. I don't think Arsenal's performance was as bad as it has been in recent weeks. I think to to come to a place like this, and I can tell you it's one of the most incredible atmospheres mm. I've ever experienced. The place is footballing cathedrals, unreal. Um, but to come there and to play quite well is something you should take some encouragement from. But again, Rory, Arsenal lacked a punch in the final third. They lacked that ability to kind of pull Milan apart. And the problem is, is when a side like Inter take the lead against you, they're happy to sit off. They're happy to sit mm. deep. They're happy to let you put balls into the penalty area and just sweep them away. Uh, three centre-halves on the pitch. It's the Inzaghi way. That's how they do it. But Arsenal just just really, really struggled to break them down. No, it is, it is interesting what's going on at Arsenal. And I think that, I mean, I, I've been so impressed by what Mikel Arteta has done. I think he's been amazing since he's been there, particularly off the back of that first year. I think that he really has done so much so well. Can you put your finger on what's gone wrong here? How, how significant do you think the, the Edu exit has been? And does that create any uncertainty for you, maybe even around the future of, of Mikel Arteta? It's really difficult to kind of understand this Edu exit fully because we don't really know what has gone down. Like we know that um, he wanted to be a CEO. We know that he had that kind of level of ambition. Arsenal opted to give that job to somebody else when it came up, which might be why, and I'm, I'm speculating here, but it might be why Edu decided to look elsewhere. He's had another job offer where he's going to have more power, definitely more money, which is mad to me. The fact that someone like Marinakis, who, yeah, is a big business tycoon over in Greece, and has and owns some football clubs, but not a football club anywhere near the size of Arsenal. It's mad to me that he's willing to pay three times the salary reportedly, and that Arsenal, if they really value Edu, didn't go well. You know, let's let's try and help you out in some way, and let's do our best to keep you. From my perspective, I'm really disappointed that Edu's left because he spoke so much about the project, about us being sort of nowhere near the end of it yet. That there was still so much work to do. And he's jumped ship. And that is hard to take as a fan. When you've really bought into someone and invested in someone and trusted in what they say, and you've been willing, even through the turbulent times, to support them because you feel that like they have the best intentions of the club at heart. And then they leave for a job like that, which I don't care what anyone says. I don't care if it's a CEO role. And I don't care if he's going to be overseeing three football clubs. Not th Those three football clubs combined are not anywhere near the size of Arsenal Football Club. So to me, it's a step down. I don't, I don't, I don't think it. that's. I don't think that's controversial at all, Harry. I, I completely, I completely agree with what you're saying. Do you think, though, that when we explore what's gone wrong for Arsenal lately, you know, Arsenal were imperious for the first half of this year. They were simply sensational. 
it's gone wrong this year. There have been some really bad performances. There's been some underwhelming player uh, performances, but equally as a team, it hasn't been good enough. Is it purely coincidental that this Edu issue has materialised now? Or do you think that this Edu issue is actually the catalyst for the problem? Basically, the question I'm asking you, Harry, do we need to talk about Edu? Is that part of the reason why it's going wrong for Arsenal? Or is that a boardroom issue that isn't really impacting the first team? I'd be very, very surprised if that kind of issue spills into the dressing room. I mean, players will will speak to Edu. They'll be in good contact with him, as we know, especially some of the Brazilian boys. But I don't know that I can... I feel like if I point the finger at Edu and what's going on there, I'm almost giving the players a free pass. Because I think in a lot of cases, it's, it's down to them. You know, they're not performing. They're not delivering. They're not coming up with ideas on the pitch. They're not... Um, producing the right decisions and then, you know, the technical level that's required when they get in the final third, that is on the players. And I know that people are pointing at Mikel Arteta right now. Um, There is a lot of talk about whether Edu's decision and and move away has had an impact. I I just think that it's a combination of a lot of things. But for me to sit here now, Rory, and say it's because of Edu, it would be me jumping the gun because I don't know that. And in my heart of hearts, I don't really believe that, to be honest. Yeah, and... Look, as much as Arsenal did get beat, and I watched that game, I watched that game in like glorious circumstances in in Las Vegas, but as much as Arsenal did get beat, you did dominate Inter, didn't you? And when you're playing to that level, when you're going to the San Siro and dominating the way that you did, even if you do end up getting beat, I don't think that it is quite crisis or, or, or major. You know, I've seen some things online, some fairly odd things online. I'm sure you've seen it as well. We don't even need to go into it. But... I think when you're when you're going to the San Siro and taking the game to a side of the quality of Inter Milan, even when you get beat, I don't necessarily think it's quite the crisis it's being portrayed to be. Is that fair? Yeah, I think when I came away from the stadium last night, I felt disappointment, not anger. When we lost at Bournemouth, I was angry. When we lost at Newcastle, I was angry because I felt like the team and the performance had let everybody down. Whereas in this instance, I, I started to sit down because you know what it's like, Rory, you've been on European away trips, the game finishes and they keep you in the away section for God knows how long. It was probably an hour last night before we had to climb down those horrible tunnel. Yeah, uh, going round and, and round and round and round. And, round. round, and, round. Yeah. and then we got stuck in those as well because they made us wait in there until they cleared some streets and, and it was a, it was a nightmare. But during that time, you got a lot of time to think, right? Um, you got a lot of time to react to the game and to try and gather your thoughts about it. And as I say, it was disappointment more than anger because if you look at what actually happened last night, Arsenal struggled in the first 10 minutes. They then ended up conceding uh, a, a penalty, which right on the stroke of half time, having taken control of the game, by the way, between that first 10 minutes and the, br- the break, they concede a really unfortunate penalty, in my opinion. Like... Uh, I mean, we see those given in UEFA competitions all the time, so I'm not going to complain about it, but it was a really difficult one to kind of process as a fan. Probably should have had one ourselves. Completely dominated the game. The only negative was that we didn't create enough clear-cut opportunities. But what did Inter create? Which no, nothing. That you don't have nothing. That's what I, like, like, absolutely nothing. Like, you, you, obviously I had that game on. It felt like to me it was just Arsenal corner after Arsenal corner after Arsenal corner. Inter had very little going on. It just shows, Rory, that you need, you don't need a bit from an Inter perspective. Look at it through an Inter lens, right? You don't need a perfect performance to get a result. Mm. So when Arsenal fans are saying in the aftermath of that game, we deserved a result last night, I don't think anyone's saying we deserve to win, but we certainly didn't deserve to lose. It's very difficult to then go after the players, go after the managers after that performance. Like it's not the type of display that you come away from feeling a a sense of disgust. That's not how I feel. I feel frustrated that we didn't get anything from the game. I'd have been content with a point because I think that's what the performance deserved. But it's certainly a step forward from what we saw uh, at the Newcastle game at the weekend. So it's not all rosy and it's not all perfect and it's not all been fixed. There's still a long way to go. But um, I think there's more positives from last night than negatives, which is weird when you've lost the game. Yeah, I agree with that though, because they were a good team. They're a good team in a difficult play. Like they got a draw with City this year, didn't they? Like they were they were a good side. Um, however, Arsenal, it's now back to back defeats, isn't it, for Arteta, which doesn't happen often. And Chelsea wait for you. You know, the fact that you've got us round the corner when you're in this form, 
I'm saying that it isn't a crisis yet. I'm saying that the outlandish and ridiculous hyperbolic statements that I'm seeing on social media about the way that it's going for Arsenal, the way that some people are, t- are talking, I think it's, I genuinely think it's ridiculous. You know, crisis, words like ineptitude, you, you're you seeing it flying around social media, failure, sack players, sack, it's, it's not, it is nonsense. But if two defeats becomes three defeats in a row, you lose a London derby, you lose to us, one of your biggest rivals. I think it's fair to say that anything other than a win against us ends your title hope. Is that is that extreme? I'm in this weird position at the moment, Rory, with the title race where I don't think we're in it anymore. Like that's really being brutally honest. I don't think we're in it. I think we're out of it right now. As we're recording this, the mm. state of play currently is that Arsenal are out of the title race. But I'm hoping that that's a temporary position and that we can put a run together to fight our way back into it. But we're out of it right now, and Arsenal have to show everybody that they're back in it, that they're worthy of being called title contenders, because the performances in recent weeks, they've dropped eight points in their last three league games. It's not good enough. It's nowhere near good enough. And the distance between ourselves and City and Liverpool is growing week by week at the moment. So unless Arsenal turn the ship around, put this run of results together, and show everybody that they deserve to be called title contenders and they deserve to be in the title race then it's fine to say for now that they're out of it Sunday's game is a must win for Arsenal it is must win and I hate being in a position going into a game away at a place like Stamford Bridge where I'm demanding a victory because I'm normally quite sensible and level-headed and I normally look at it and think well a point good point here yeah, yeah, yeah good point here good point there and you can make it up along the way we are desperate for three points and if we don't get three points the problem is is that you've got a a long international break for everybody to complain about it, for everybody to moan about it, for people to start to overthink it and start to find problems that probably don't even actually exist. And the whole mood around the club becomes even worse than it is today. And that's my real fear about what might happen if Arsenal fail to get all three points at the bridge. Yeah, can you put your finger on what's happened, Harry? Is there like, is there an obvious answer to this? So, you know, the when when we turned into 2024... Arsenal were just relentless. They came back from Dubai. Ben White became the best right back in the league. Saliba was impenetrable. Everything was going Arsenal's way. You were winning game after game after game. You were sensational at the start of the year. Since the turn of of the season, since we've gone into this season, you've only won five out of ten games. That's incomparable to the team that you were at the back end of last season. Is is there an obvious thing? Like I'm looking at it. The injury to Odegaard be the suggestion. I mean, certain certain midfielders signings. They've started slowly, like Raheem Sterling, it's been a slow start. Mikel Marino, slow start. Declan Rice, perhaps not the level that you would expect. Is all of that fair? Yeah, I I think it's a combination of things. I I don't think there really is one simple answer to it. The Odegaard injury hasn't helped. Other injuries haven't helped as well. And I think that Arsenal have had to adapt the way they play to try and cope with those injuries. And that has made them a completely different team at points. They've tried to lean on what was probably their next biggest strength, which was their defensive solidity. And the injuries that they've had have made that impossible to do. Um, You couldn't trust in that back line. We've conceded a lot of goals recently, like not a mad amount in terms of volume, but we just don't keep clean sheets anymore, which is obviously a big problem. And when your attack's misfiring and you're not keeping clean sheets, you ain't going to win football matches. It's as simple as that. But, you know, there's a lot of players that, are not performing at the level that we know they're capable of. You mentioned Raheem Sterling there. I'm really, really frustrated with this at the minute because what the hell was the point in bringing him in if in the last two games when we've been chasing a goal, we haven't brought him on? We haven't even turned to him. He's just been sitting on the bench doing nothing. Which That's an Arteta decision though, isn't it? Exactly. And I look at that and I think if you genuinely believed that this guy was going to improve our attack, if you genuinely believed that this was a deal worth doing late into the night on deadline day, then why don't you trust him? Uh, Do you know where I thought Raheem Sterling was perhaps treated, not unfairly, but maybe the wrong decision was made. You know, when you went down to 10 men at Bournemouth, I thought that he was your, he was your spark. I thought Raheem Sterling watching that game, thought he was your best player, but certainly in in an attacking sense. And then Arteta hooked him. You're like, surely Raheem Sterling's pace away from home, down to 10 men. You, If you, if there is a player that you want in your team who knows how to secure three points, perhaps when the odds are against you, it's got to be Raheem Sterling, just for the experience alone. So I, I do agree with you, but 
all being said, it hasn't worked, has it? As as perhaps you and I both agreed it would prior to uh, prior to him making his debut for Arsenal. Yeah, it hasn't worked yet. That's fair to say. I, I think the biggest problem, though, for Arsenal when it comes to the creativity issue is, is probably in the midfield at the minute. Um, I, I'm not ha- I'm not fully on board with Mikel Marino at the moment. Um, I don't know what to make of him. I, I'm not really seeing what it is that I was told he has when he came into the club. Um, Jewel Monster is what they called him. Doesn't seem to win anywhere near enough jewels in this Arsenal team at the minute. The creativity is never going to come from Mikel Marino because he's not Martin Odegaard, even though Mikel Arteta's tried to use him in that role once or twice. Having Declan Rice in the midfield and expecting him to dictate the tempo from deep while using Partey at right back also has been a bad decision, in my opinion. Mm. It's quite clear that Thomas Partey is Arsenal's best deep line midfield player. Um, And he's been Arsenal's one shining light, by the way, in this last three weeks, four weeks, where things haven't been going very well again. At San Siro, he was outstanding. Um, so I think it's a balanced thing right now. And I looked at the team yesterday when it came out and I'm sitting there thinking, what has Mikel Marino done to justify playing ahead of Jorginho, for example? Yeah. What has Leandro Trossard done in that position that he played last night, which is just off the front man, to justify him being picked over even 17-year-old Ethan Wanneri at the moment. Yeah. Like there's a lot of players that aren't performing and it's as if Mikel's got this, this almost, not obsession, but he really wants seniority to always come out on top. And sometimes that isn't the way to go. He shows that with certain players, but with others, he, he, he doesn't. Like he didn't bring Zinchenko on against Liverpool when we were desperate for a left-back. Instead, he brought on a kid that was a midfielder growing up and has been pushed into left back like it's there's there's so many mixed messages coming from him at the moment in terms of his selections decisions that he's making I'm really struggling to understand exactly what's going on and in the transfer market like signing Mikel Marino kind of fine you know he he had a had a great tournament for Spain scored that iconic goal when he ran around the thing emulating his father it was it, it was kind of one of those signings that made sense but what you can't do is allow Fabio Vieira to leave Emil Smith Rowe to leave and then pick up a Martin Odegaard injury because there's basically no creativity, nobody there to take on the role that is performed by Martin Odegaard. Maybe it's as simple as that. Odegaard goes back into the team and once he finds rhythm, finds full fitness, maybe everything will change. Yeah, hopefully it does um, because it needs to and quickly. But just on that point, I think you're absolutely right. Like You let a certain profile of player go and you don't replace that profile, then you're going to have an imbalance in your squad. And on my podcast after the Newcastle game, the thing that I sort of led with and the thing that I was really pushing in terms of a narrative was Mikel Arteta has gone so far down the route of I need physical powerhouses that he's forgotten about the technical side of the game. Mm -hmm. And, And it's no coincidence that the people that physically aren't as strong are all the ones that have moved out. Emil Smith Rowe kept breaking down. Out you go. Fabio Vieira, very weak physically. Out you go. And then you bring in more of these big six foot giants, which is all good in certain game states. But in a game state where you need to break a team down and you need a bit more creativity, yeah. the technical aspect has to be prioritized over the physical one. And, and that's where I think there's an imbalance at the moment. I wonder if Mikel Arteta has gone too far down the physical route and has neglected, if you like, the, yeah, the, the base level technical of technical game. quality that's required to play in an Arsenal midfield. What, what was the mood in the away end yesterday? Like the, the away European support, whatever the feeling within there, like I'm always very keen to know what, basically if I don't support the team, I can only pick up the sentiment via friends who support them and then online. And I think online mm. is dangerous. I, it doesn't represent e- any fan base. What I'm seeing online is a lot of fairly toxic hostility towards Mikel Arteta. Is any of that resonating in a stadium at all? No, that that that's not yeah. what we got. I thought you'd say that. I thought, I thought that. It's, it's, it's not what we got at San Siro last night. I mean, I've made the trip. I know exactly how expensive it was to make this trip. It was It's incredibly expensive. And Milan's not a cheap place no. um, to go and spend some time. Um, you know, I know how many fans you know, really put themselves out to get here. They all turned up at San Siro. It's not, we're not talking about, you know, the the treatment of the English fans abroad. That's not what we're doing here, but it wasn't great in a lot of ways. And a lot of people have gone out of their way to make sure that they're here. And to their credit, 
even though Arsenal were beaten last night, I think there was an acknowledgement within those uh, in the stands that, you know what, it was, it was a decent performance. We didn't get a result and the performance certainly had room for improvement in it, but it was good enough to not come away sort of effing and blinding and going after the players and, and picking out individuals. Everybody was forced to stay back, but just up, when the players came over to, to applaud the fans, I sort of had a look around me because I was really interested in what the reaction was going to be as well. Because if you keep losing games, that kind of frustration, it can build up and sometimes it can spill over. Genuinely, there was none of that in the stands last night. There was a few people who were disappointed, but it never turned into vitriol, which was nice. Yeah. Um, just before you go, Harry, Chelsea on the weekend, tell me, what do you think? Do you think you'll get the result? Are you worried about us? What are your feelings about this game? Yeah, I'm worried. Um, it, it's it's not a long time since you said that, isn't it? The five nil yeah. feels a long time ago now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's been a while since I said that, but genuinely, I've been really, really impressed with Chelsea so far this season. Like I expected them to be a little bit wet behind the ears at times, and I think we've seen glimpses of that. But generally, overall, they're on the right path. They're doing really well. We're not playing great at the minute. I do feel a little bit more confident about it today than I did yesterday because we've gone to San Siro and put in a decent performance, which with all due respect, I think is a much more hostile place to go than Stamford Bridge. So, you know, I think it's it's a game that we're capable of getting a result in. And I think we've got to believe that we can. But again, it's so dependent on who's fit and available for Arsenal. Odegaard got a few minutes at the end of the game last night. Hopefully they were saving him to start at Stamford Bridge. Declan Rice has got a broken toe, apparently, so we don't know if he's, he's going to play able... on, apparently, though. He's going to he's gonna play. He is, he's, yes. he's Roy of the Rovers, man. He's going to play with the with the broken toe. <laughs> but this is this is Mikel Arteta's Arsenal, and you never know. You know, there's been times where we were convinced someone was going to play. They didn't. And there's been other times where we thought someone was out and they ended up making a miraculous recovery. So I'd always be a little bit wary on, on the noises that come out of Arsenal Football Club with regards to injuries. But I think Arsenal are capable... The problem is we haven't seen that standard of performance from Arsenal for a long time. So I, like you, make Chelsea favourites. And if Chelsea do win this game, I think people are going to start talking about them in a much more positive light. And I think for Arsenal, as far as the title talk is concerned, at least for now, it's going to be curtains. Yeah, mate, it's going to be a huge game. Harry, safe journey back from Italy, from the San Siro. Um, I hope you had a great trip um, and I'm fairly happy that your team got beat as well. So you had a good time. But I was delighted to see Arsenal lose and I hope to see more of the same on the weekend. Harry Simu from the Chronicles of Aguna. Really appreciate your time, sir. Thanks for having me, mate. All the best. Right, so there we have it. A huge thank you to Harry for finding the time to join us. I thought that was a really interesting and insightful conversation. Chelsea Arsenal up next. A London derby with so much jeopardy. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. What is your score prediction for that game? And why is it going so wrong for Arsenal Football Club? Really keen to see your thoughts in the comments section below. Have a wonderful day in a bit.